All right. Um, hi, everyone. The title of my talk today is Multiphase Rift Lengthening and Widening Facilitated by Progressive Structural Inheritance, Shire Rift Zone, East Africa. My name is Fonarin Kolawole. This was a project I worked on as part of my PhD work at the University of Oklahoma under the supervision of Brett Carpenter. I would like to thank Estela Tequana, Daniel Laudavila, Travis Vick, and Ari Costa for collaborating with me on this project. So models of continental extension suggest a basin ward migration and focusing of tectonic strain into a narrow zone along the rift axis as continental extension progresses. However, it is not clear if this pattern um, of strain migration is expected to occur across all rift scales, single and multi-phase extension, and maybe in both early and later stages of extension. So we, in this study, we address two important questions. And the first one is what spatial patterns of strain migration characterize multi-phase rift growth? And the second is how does the progressive inheritance of structures over these multiple phases actually influence the patterns of the strain migration? So our study area is the Shire Reef Zone. So a nice um, um, lead from Ake's um, um, studies because he showed an example from the Teolo Fault right here. So um, we address these two questions in the Shire Reef Zone, East Africa. And this basin is actually one of the least understood segments of the East African Reef System. It is located just south of the Malawi Rift right here. And um, although it is a very young rift, it has actually experienced all the three phases of extension that has been recorded in Eastern Africa. So the first, the first phase of extension that this basin um, experienced was in the Permian to early Jurassic, which we call RP1. And we also call that the Karoo phase of extension, and it was magmatic. The second phase of extension, RP2, was between the mid-Jurassic and the Cretaceous, which was also magmatic. And the third, third phase of extension is currently going on, and it you know, recorded to, uh, I've started in the Quaternary. This basin is bounded to the Southwest by the Tete Fault system right here, and to the Northeast by the Mona Fault system, Namalambu Fault, and the Tiolu Mona um, Camacho Fault system on this part. And I would like to say that the pre-rift basement here shown in gray and labeled PCCB is actually dominated by Precambrian gneisses and granulites. And these colored polygons represent the outcrops of seen rift sedimentary, volcanic and intrusive igneous rocks. So for our study, in order to delineate the basement fabrics, we used um, two aeromagnetic data sets. Um, one is a regional lower resolution aeromag that covers both the rift and the surrounding areas. And the second one is a higher resolution aeromagnetic data that is focused, um, that, that was acquired uh, by the Mala Geological Survey of Malawi in this northeastern part of the basin. These aeromagnetic data sets are quite excellent because they provide very nice imaging of the trends of the basement fabrics as they are, as the signals are able to penetrate the weathered basement and even sedimentary cover. Um, in order to better constrain the trends of you know, fabrics that we see in aeromagnetic data, we also obtain measurements of basement foliation from previous published um, maps and, and um, field measurements in the area. Um, also, we used published geological maps and topographic U-shaped maps um, to delineate fault escarpments. So you can see fault escarpments right there. You know, you can see even older rift, um, like early, um, earlier phase um, fault escarpment. So we used um, this U-shaped maps to delineate those and we integrate our interpretations with previous publications um, from geologic maps that cover different parts of the basin. Also, I would like to say that um, this U-shaped maps also allow us to delineate areas of active quaternary sedimentation. Um, as you can see, this very smooth area versus the basement and eroding early rift um, sedimentary and volcanic rocks. In order to delineate subsurface rift structures and rift fill, we use aeromagnetic data again because they penetrate the sedimentary cover and they're able to show us features like dikes within sedimentary cover, um, buried fault segments, as you see here, and even buried volcanic, um, buried faulted volcanic flows, uh, which dominate this part of the basin. So I'll run you quickly through our result as a lot of details, but I'm just going to give you the main highlights. So part one, did the shear lift actually lengthen and widen over the, phase, over the three phases of extension? Um, so let's look at the rift length during RP1 and R RP2 versus RP3. Well, going by the published geologic maps of the basin, the areas here colored um, uh, with the colored polygons actually represent the surface extent of the basin during RP1 and RP2. The Chuta area shown here in um, dotted white ellipse 
actually represents um, an area of active quaternary deposition in the basin with the fault bounding it to the southwest. Well, um, within the same area where we have act, uh, qu quaternary sedimentation, the aeromagnetic data shows well-oriented basement fabrics that are similar to those on the rift flank. And this tells us that um, there is no presence, first from aeromagnetic data, that, that, that it tells us first that this quaternary cover is quite thin, so just a couple of hundred of meters of cover, and there is no presence of volcanic units beneath that quaternary cover, else we would not see this basement fabric. And third, the published geological maps does not show the presence of any um, RP1 or RP2 um, sedimentary rocks outcropping anywhere around this basin. Now, it's possible that there might be RP1, RP2 sedimentary units beneath the quaternary cover here, but we don't have any um, well penetration or shallow bowl that could tell us any more information. So our preferred um, interpretation is that in um, RP1 and RP2, the basin was more like 200 kilometers long, but in RP3, it lengthened by about 32%. So let's look at the rift width. The key to answering this question um, relies primarily on the presence of RP1 volcanic units beneath the quaternary cover right here in the lower Shire Valley area. Aeromagnetic data shows us that on the hanging wall of this buried fault segment, there are volcanic faults that are buried. So um, from both the aeromagnetic data and well data, that is, that's just an interpretation we can make that beneath the quaternary cover, we have volcanic flows here. And you can see the fabric of the volcanic flows. However, on the footwall of the fault, we cannot see that same fabric represented there. What we see there is the is a buried um, um, version of the fabric of the Precambrian basement that is exposed in this part of the basin, or the, this part of the area. And what that tells us is that there's actually, it, it, what that tells us that the RP1 or um, volcanic flows does not extend into the footwall of that fault. And lastly, this shallow bowl, these two shallow bowls actually penetrate beneath the quaternary cover on the footwall of that fault. And there's um, from the little stratigraphic report of those bowls, um, the quaternary cover directly overlays the Precambrian basement. There's no presence of RP1 or RP2 sedimentary rocks. Um, maybe in this part of the basin, there may be, but our best interpretation now is that um, overall, um, this footwall part of the of this buried um, early rift border fault does not was not a dominant large scale um, depot center during the RP1 and RP2 um, evolution of this basin. Therefore, we interpret that the Mwanza fault was actually the eastern border fault of this basin. So although the basin um, was about, so we can interpret that the basin was like one around 19 kilometer wide um, between um, during RP1 and RP2, but in RP3, it's lengthened to the northeast by about 13%. Oh, sorry, it's widened to the northeast by about 13%. And this border fault right here, the Tiolo fault, represents a new quaternary or RP3 border fault of the bay, eastern border fault of the basin. There's been no recorded um, rifting activity to the southwest of the basin. That's why we interpret the widening to be to the northeast. And here's an example from a recently published paper by Shows et al. 2020, actually showing that, um, showing the same pattern of rift lengthening in the Malawi Rift um, over time. So part two, the influence of progressive structural inheritance on the lengthening and widening of this rift basin. Um, we analyzed the orientation of basement fabric um, along um, the flanks of the rift and even within this uplifted basement block at the center of the rift, as you can see the rift bifurcates around that uplifted block, which we refer to as the Kanakana Hurst. And this rose diagram shows the frequency um, as the distribution of the basement fabrics that we've interpreted from aeromagnetic data and from hill shade map where possible. And here we observe that the RP1 rift actually terminates at a previously mapped and well-known shear zone that extends across the basin and along the footwall of this early rift border fault. Or at least in the western um, and to the south of the basin, we see that the at least in the eastern part, the border fault also terminates at this previously mapped Precambrian shear zone, which is known as the Lurio shear zone. Um, on this part of the basin, we don't have mo much information of what the you know the evolution of sediment or um, rift field looks like here, but it looks like there's also a bend in the trend of the border fault and also some if, if magnetic lineament that looks like a continuation of the Lurio shear zone. So essentially, um, we we interpret that most of the length of the early rift border faults actually align parallel to the trend of the Precambrian basement fabrics, which suggests um, a control of the basement or, or an exploitation of the 
pre-rift basement fabrics on the geometry and location of the spotter fault. And we also interpret that the, pre, the inherited pre-rift basement um, shear zones also kind of established the entire architecture uh, or entire length of the RP1, RP2 rift as a delineated determination of the um, RP1, RP2 rift termination. Um, so the RP1 igneous dikes, yeah, so I, as I mentioned earlier, the RP1 was magmatic, but we found out that the RP1 igneous dike primarily um, trend northeast, southwest, and this has been published in um, several um, um, papers, well, a few papers on the basin and geological reports of um, geological report um, by the Geological Survey of Malawi. But our interpretation here is that since the since this um, RP1 dikes are orthogonal to the rift trend and the border for trend, and I, I would mention that this RP1 dikes um, primarily dominates this northeastern part of the basin again. Um, so what you know we'll be talking a lot about this not just 10 to 11 minutes now. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So um, well, so here we we do not find any strong control of structural inheritance on the RP1 um, dikes. And we looked at the influence of RP1 faults on RP2 deformations, and we see features that may suggest this. Um, so the regional low resolution aeromagnetic data shows us ring shaped um, features buried beneath this southeastern part of the basin where RP2 deformation was in subsidence and sediment deposition was primarily localized right here. So we see this buried um, ring shape magnetic features that can be interpreted as intrusions, uh, as buried intrusions or buried volcanoes beneath the R RP2 um, units. And um, the clustering and trend of this um, um, ring, ring shape features actually reminded us of um, features that we've seen in Northern Malawi Rift um, in the Rungwe Volcanic Province regions where clusters of um, volcanic centers align with rift fault and align parallel to the border fault. And here we interpret that the Northwest trend of RP2 um, intra-rift igneous centers might actually have been controlled by earlier, earlier phase, so RP1 faults um, that may have served as conduits for magma ascent. And uh, we also examined the orientation of RP2 dikes. Um, I don't want to go into the details, but I will tell you that the RP2 dikes primarily trend north-south and northwest. And you can see a nice one right there, overprinting lower um, amplitude dikes, which trend northeast. So RP1 dikes, but these are RP2 dikes. And um, here we can see a lot of the RP2 dikes trending, um, um, swinging or changing orientation as they approach um, the border fault of the rift. And we see another one here and aligned parallel to the border fault of the rift. Essentially, we interpret that locally the RP1 fault served as conduit for RP2 magma intrusions because we see a nice um, correlation between the orientations as the um, dikes approach this border fault. And um, we also see that in the Chuta area, where um, which represents the lengthening section of the basin, the basement fabrics are rift parallel, as I mentioned earlier. And we interpret that they are well oriented for bridge exploitation in the current stress field, thus facilitating the localization of strain ahead of the earlier termination of the rift. Um, so we see again that even from the aeromagnetic data, the basement fabrics change orientation and trend the rift into a rift orthogonal direction, representing again the present determination of that new newer RP3 segment of the rift, which suggests this um, continuous influence of pre-rift basement um, fabrics and shear zones on the episodic propagation and migration of the rift tip. And finally, um, we looked at the shear rift valley to actually see the structures that control the, my, um, the, the widening, the RP3 winding of the basin. And there are lots of details here, but um, I'm just gonna go straight to the point and give you the highlights. So we looked at the orientation of, of, of the fault of this new border fault with respect to the basement fabrics. And we see just as Aka, Aki mentioned earlier that the fault exploited um, the, this pre basement fabrics here. So we see the pre basement look um, controlling the localization of RP3 border fault string. However, at, along the axis of this new active um, sub-basin that represents the widening of the rift, we see that the earlier um, phase border fault is actually decoupled and the central part has been buried beneath the quaternary cover here, which is quite interesting to us. However, in the um, depth to basement um, map that we generated from aeromagnetic data, so depth to magnetic basement, we see that there, there are um, northeast trending um, 
zones of subsidence, fault control subsidence that align with the trend of the die of the RP1 dikes. And we also see lots of indications, and this has been shown by the World Mouth 2020, well, which I showed earlier, that um, the breaching of this new border fault also seems to follow um, an exploitation of this RP1 dikes. So um, that they control the odd linkage of the new border fault. So uh, overall, we can conclude that the spatial temporal stream migration during multi-phase rift growth may actually record episodes of rift lengthening and widening and not necessarily um, migration, based on what migration and localization of tectonic strain. And that the spatial temporal stream migration during multi-phase rift growth can be significantly controlled by the progressive inheritance of crossed out deformation. Thanks for listening and I will welcome your questions. Thanks a lot. Do we have uh, questions for Fula? I would be particularly interested why uh, we have the two first phases as being magmatic and the last one magma poor. How, how, is, the, how is this happening? Very good question. You know, <laughs> this was one of the things that puzzled me when I was working on this study. Like, how do you shut off that magma source? So um, first of all, um, I mean, there has been papers that actually show that um, if you have a prolonged inter-rift um, phase, you know, in a multi-phase rift, you may actually have strengthening, like significant strengthening of the lithosphere. And I wonder if that has to do with the shutting off of the magmatic source associated with the earlier rift phase. It, it's an interesting study. This is, Geo Rift is very, is one of the least studied segments of the East African rift system. And I, I can imagine that lithospheric imaging of this, um, especially that southeastern part of the basin where we have a lot of multi-phase magmatism. Um, I think lithospheric imaging of that area may have a lot to tell us about, you know, what could have happened in the past and why it was shut off. But yeah, that's, that's an interesting problem. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, we have time for one quick one. Uh, Suzanne? I just managed to type it in, but I'm very happy to, um, to also ask it. So where you say that um, you have your rifts terminating at these um, rift perpendicular shear zones, so, that's very interesting because we, we tend to focus on, on things that happen in parallel, right? So whether or not my fault activity is, is reactivating these, these fabrics, but you see these cases where, where it actually terminates, but do you see any evidence for that the rift might bend into? Yes. And um, so I don't know if this error map, if this map is clear enough, but um, essentially you see this um, Sanago shear zone as it extends across the rift actually bends. And this is from published geologic maps on this shear zone, like field studies of the shear zone. They show that the um, shear zone actually bends um, into this south, um, southeastern trend. And where the rift bends, we see a plane of that early rift border fault right there. And the rift border fault also bends. You know, it's quite intriguing to see the fault bend, but it actually bends and splays across that um, bend in the shear zone. So. Yeah, so this is a very important observation because it tells us that the rift did not just terminate, but the, the border fault actually is played. Like you can see interaction, you know, multi, multi style interaction between the fault and, and the shear zone. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I find that really fascinating where we have these cases where it would actually stop a rift or whether it, it sort of interacts with it in some way. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Suzanne.